Thank you. Uh, you know, we may, may do a little uh, interactive throughout this uh, just to kind of keep it, keep it going and um, let a few people get in before I start uh, identifying them as Dodger fans uh, <laughs> coming late and leaving early. Uh, so I guess we can kind of start there. How, how many people in here would uh, consider themselves baseball fans? And then Giants fans? A's fans? And Dodger fans? It's okay. Dodger fans are all right. Um, as the title says, and um, every time I throw that title out there, it's like it's a mouthful, and I'm not quite sure if anybody knows what it means. I'm not sure if I know what it means sometimes, but um, Vice President of Strategic Revenue Services. It, so it sounded good at the time uh, when I came up with it. Um, my, my area at the Giants is everything from, you know, if I want to get booed out of the room, I say I'm the guy who sets all the ticket prices, um, which is true. Um, <laughs> um, which, you know, it has a good side and a bad side. Um, I also, within my group, have um, CRM responsibility, ticket technology, um, customer communication, email marketing, um, the relationship with Major League Baseball Advanced Media, um, you know, potentially the most successful internet company ever created, I think, um, at least uh, very dumb luck by the owners that that occurred. Um, um, give you an idea, my, my direct reports, I've got a senior director of ticket accounting, so I have the entire um, ticket accounting function and ticket processing side. Um, we've got a data analyst CRM manager, um, a manager of sales strategy, and then kind of a, a catch-all strategic solutions coordinator who does everything from um, our customer survey development, to uh, working on uh, keeping the sales gamification program going, um, as well as starting to work with our uh, data visualizations with Tableau and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and then the infamous TBD, um, <laughs> which it, 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 I put it up there specifically because it, it's a very painful decision for me and that I would love to add an analyst. Uh, w one thing you'll notice about all those people is None of them are a, a pure analyst. They don't, no, nobody's unencumbered to actually be able to just sit and do analytic work. They all have, you know, a day job, and we try to do analytics on the side. Um, and that's a very challenging, but it's the nature of, of at least pro sports on the business side in, in, at the Giants. And I would say part of that is because we were maybe a leader in analytics um, doing it as a part-time job, and a bunch of teams now have kind of leapfrogged us, where they actually have created analytic groups that are more free to truly be analysts. Um, so I've got a very operationally oriented CRM manager that's got to keep Salesforce working for, you know, roughly 100 users, in addition to trying to find some time to do analytics. Sales manager that's putting on special events and, you know, selling 20,000 Little League tickets to a bunch of uh, little Leagues, um, and then obviously my Senior Director of Ticket Accounting plays a role in some of our overall corporate reporting, but isn't really an analyst either. So, you know, we try, we try to do magic. We try to do analytics with a, not a lot of resource. Um, and, and as we kind of go quickly through these slides, you'll kind of see why the, the environment is the way that it is. Um, we're actually positioned inside uh, within the Giants, what's called the Ticket Sales and Services Group. Um, so even though we view ourselves as an internal consulting group to the rest of the organization, we actually don't have, uh, you know, I don't even directly report to the um, Senior Vice President of Business Operations. I've got one level in between um, there. But we try to consult with sponsorship, with community relations with the retail group, a series of other people, and try to view ourselves. We, we jokingly call ourselves Switzerland inside. We want to be viewed and have credibility with all the different silos. Because again, one of the realities of the Giants organization is a very siloed business operation and makes data management, data, even access and cooperation internally is a challenge. And so one of our goals is also to champion effectively universal data 
trying to get everybody to be willing to share. You know, you think about people within an industry or in general sharing, we can't even share within our own building sometimes uh, in terms of the customers. Um, to know that a particular company is a major sponsor, you know that because they got a sign on in center field. Um, but whether they're a big donator to the Junior Giants community program, you don't necessarily know that. And even within the ticketing world, you've got a split between the people that sell the luxury suites and the people that sell the regular tickets. And everybody's guarding their own leads. You know, it's supposed to be one big happy family, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, and then the other group that I put on there specifically is we also have competitors in that it's the, the baseball analytics guys. It's the, it's the money ball guys over in, on the baseball side. And they're competitors only from the standpoint of general company resources. When it comes to the issue of IT support, uh, various other things, we're always, the business side analytics is a huge second class citizen inside the building relative to the guys that are doing the baseball analytics side. They've got a much larger team, probably double the size of, of what I've got. They're all mostly dedicated analysts. They don't have any side jobs. Um, and they've got the full attention of IT and various other um, support groups within the organization. Um, even to the extent now, if you go read the Giants Media Guide, you will see all the IT developers actually listed in the baseball section of the org, org guide, which uh, I found extremely painful this year when that change was made. Um, so now we'll get to the, the part of the topic of the day. Any, any guesses out there as to what is being represented here or what these numbers and what this might represent? This game right here is significant because it's the last non-sellout at AT&T Park. September 30 of 2010. Um, the Giants are currently at 423 consecutive sellouts. Um, that's the major league history of sellouts. We've, we now have the National League record, passing the Phillies a while ago. And one of the uh, huge side benefits of this, this talk today is I found out we actually have a goal this year. We've got the Indians to pass. We knew that the Red Sox were way down the road. And when I went back to research this, I read the article that w when we passed the Phillies, they wrote that the second longest streak was the Indians at 455. And we'll actually get there um, this year. Because I thought it was going to be kind of a boring year. If we made it through, there's no double zeros to uh, acknowledge this year. We started at 408. And if we add on the 81 this year, we'll be at 489, which isn't as sexy as 400 or 500. So um, we got the Indians to pass. So now I got to go back and figure out what day that's going to be uh, when we get there. But we're talking about the sellout streak because that becomes or has become this major um, focus. It's got its own momentum. And as an analytic group and as a business strategy side, it's become its own, its own animal, its own beast. Um, so as I said, 423 games and counting, it's a gift and a curse. It's, it's great. We take great pride in it. We're, we're accomplishing it. But the amount of analytic brain time that it takes to try to keep that going, think about, you know, the Dodger Sunday versus the Padre Tuesday night. I apologize to any Padre fans. For whatever reason, we always pick on the Padres when we do these examples. Um, um, and the major tool here within this, again, from the analytics side, is dynamic pricing. Um, theoretically, you're trying to maintain the sellout streak, but at the same time, as I said at the bottom, but don't forget to maximize ticket revenue while you're doing it. Um, and those are not aligned goals. Uh, trust me, living, living in the world of this, if I was trying to maximize revenue, sellout streak would not be part of that model um, in any way. And so basically the, um, the mandate from, from, from Larry and, and management is do them both. We want all the money that we can, but don't let the sellout streak go. Um, so as I said, just to give you a sense of what that task is, you're trying to maximize revenue, fill the house for 81 unique events in the span of 180 days during the season. Not much time to come up for air, 
They're all kind of different. There's a huge um, set of factors that are involved in trying to understand the demand for each of those games. Um, and everything, all sorts of things can change it. Um, for the strangest reason, you imagine this last week, we were absolutely huge Portland Trailblazer fans on um, last Thursday night, when I think it was Thursday night, when they had a chance to close out that series in game six. And why? So that we wouldn't have a conflict last night, I believe it was last night, where the neck, it had, had that series gone seven, then the Warriors wouldn't have started until Tuesday, and they would have played again last night and been in direct conflict with our game. So, I mean, that, all crazy things like that go into this concept of how do we try to get this all done and factor this all through. Um, just to throw a few things out here, factors related to the demand for a baseball game. And this is, this is a handful of them, but what I wanted to really point out is, again, from an analytic standpoint, many of these are known somewhat in advance. Many of these are not known until 24 hours before the game. Or in the case of this warrior conflict, we had about three days notice to know whether it was gonna happen or not happen. Um, uh, so just to quickly go through, obviously day of the week, time of the year, game time, some of those are within our control, the game time is our. Um, the schedule comes out you know, roughly in September, so we maybe get about a month to work with the schedule before we're actually setting any kind of pricing strategies and putting that into place. But you still have, and again, I think back to um, this, I'm now in my 25th year at the Giants. Um, I think back to the old days where every game was the same price. Um, you know, the concept of how things have changed with dynamic pricing now and um, the, the nature of that and what we've learned analytically to get to this point. You know, dynamic pricing even uh, originally didn't work because dynamic pricing doesn't work without variable pricing of the base product. Um, you know, when we opened up the uh, double play ticket window, um, which was the first electronic ticket exchange back in 2000, predated StubHub long before any of that, opened with a new ballpark here, um, you'd get that customer because we printed $30 on it every ticket for them for the season. And so they would complain when they go to the electronic exchange, well, you know, why on the, and I'll pick on Pittsburgh now, the Pittsburgh Tuesday night, I can only get $10 for that ticket. And we, because we thought it was the right open market, or market practice, we put it at the actual floor of $30 as to the lowest you could put the pro ticket up for. So we really created an unfair market, asked these guys to try to live in it, and on the Dodger Sunday, they got their $60 or $70 and they were happy. But on the, on the Pittsburgh Tuesday, we told them the minimum you can post it for is the $30 we printed on the ticket, the, the straight line pricing, and they couldn't sell it, it didn't go anywhere. Um, that was year one, and now, you know, 16 years in, we know a lot more. We don't control the exchange anymore, but we understand a lot more of what's there. But again, I have always told people the most important component of that whole project was not the revenues we would get from the transactions and doing the secondary market, it was the information. It was understanding what our product really was worth. By being able to put your product out in a circumstance where it's in a market condition and you're allowing the market to tell you what's there, every year we've gotten better pricing since then. Um, and the secondary market, while there's money to be made in there and that's valuable, to the teams and the people that are actually establishing the pricing, there's nothing better than the information that comes from that. Um, another quick uh, question, how many in here, when I say ticket broker, is that a bad thing or a good thing? How many think it's a bad thing, the concept of ticket brokers? And how many think it's a good thing? Okay, good. The Giants are very much on it's a good thing side of things. Um, we are very pro ticket broker and that whole concept. It's a, a significant part of our business model. Um, it allows for efficiency of sale. We probably have, you know, I don't know, a handful less salespeople on staff because of the fact that we're willing to sell the ticket brokers and embrace them. Um, and again, when I talk to my compatriots at these other teams that are in this very anti-ticket broker mentality, I just put it to them and say, you're pricing your tickets wrong. If you price your tickets correctly, the broker is not evil in any way. The broker is just somebody that's out there that's doing things. And we price our tickets to actually work and partner with the brokers. 
understanding that we need to not price at full market in order for them to be part of things. Um, but anyway, that's uh, ticket brokers are not bad guys, really. Um, anything up here that is particularly interesting? Pitching matchups is always tough. Timmy, you know, Timmy Linscombe, who's having his workout today, um, always had that extra draw for us. You know, you, you can't even quantify it when it's going good, going bad, didn't matter. Maybe it was the hair. And <laughs> Timmy always just had that extra oomph at the box office for us. Um, the other thing that is crazy, ridiculously important is the gate giveaway. You know, there's no such, no, nothing drives like the right bobblehead. Um, and, and now with dynamic pricing, in the old days it used to be, again, from the analytics side, it was like, well, what do you have to do to sell out the game? Because again, you were in this kind of fixed pricing kind of world, and you wouldn't put a promotional item on a game that might, quote unquote, sell out on its own. Now it's all changed. It's like, well, what, what kind of revenue can the bobblehead drive? And again, we keep joking that we're trying to sell out these games, but we try to sell them out in the top of the second inning, which makes my life very, very exciting. Um, because when you're taking it down that close, if, you're, if I really price it right, I haven't done my job right if it sells out a week ahead of time, if we didn't have any tickets to sell, I've done something wrong. Because again, it's, it's that balance between maximizing revenue and selling out the house. And again, I'd love to have a job where I got, a, I got 81 times to try to do that, and if I missed a couple times, it wouldn't matter. I don't have that leeway, so we gotta kind of focus on it, and it becomes all-consuming as to how this gets done. Um, quickly, I'll try to do this one quicker here. A um, few tools that we use to do it, like I mentioned, season packaging with variable game tiers, absolutely critical to make this all work. Um, the promotional items and additional programming can adjust demand. You know, you have a problem game, throw a fireworks show on it. Um, you know, again, we miss on prices all the time. Uh, we've got, uh, right now, we're trying to figure out how we f fix July 4th. We thought July 4th for us this year was going to be great, you know, look good on the schedule. It was against the Rockies, but, you know, we thought we'd be okay. I think it's our second lowest selling game right now for the whole season. So we are very much in reprogramming of it. Because again, we've got a commitment to our season ticket holders with that variable pricing in the package. We've got floors that we can't go under. And so the answer is you've got to add value to the game. You can't change the price. So again, it's a lot, lot of business theory, a lot of analytics, trying to figure out how do we make all this stuff work. Um, um, this one here, you know, dynamic pricing of when the season starts, I got 1,600 different prices to think about. We got probably 20, 20 to 22 different price scales for each of the 81 games. And every one of them theoretically can be managed both on the price side and on the inventory and ticket availability side. Um, so pretty complex uh, puzzle to work on. Um, you know, growing is the whole social media, um, the digital component of trying to shape demand. Um, got CRM systems in place to support the, the new sales and the retention side. Um, and then the big one up there is a special event programming. Um, that's the one that used to be focused on doing Irish Heritage Night on a Tuesday night to try to add some extra demand to a game that wouldn't normally take it. Now that's extended to now it's, you know, our next to last game of the year is Dodgers on a Saturday, but it's also Star Wars Day. With um, what they talk about is, and now, now they're doing what we term three tiers of marketing for that special event. There'll be a, a Star Wars item that you get coming through the gate. You can also pay more to get a special Star Wars item and pay extra for that. And then there'll be a special pregame party for really Star Wars aficionados <laughs> that you can pay a VIP price to do that as well. And you tier through all three of those. You have different levers in terms of, you know, depending on how these items are selling, you're upping and lowering the spread over the regular price for the ticket as you do that. Um, all, all more fun and games. Um, yep. Sure. So, yeah, yeah I, will, I, I will blow through these. Um, just a sense of data sources. The main thing here is to see that most of the data that we get 
doesn't come to us cleanly. It's all coming from a third party, adds all sorts of extra complexity to what we're trying to do. You're dependent on outside vendors and their quality and their skills to get the data that we need. And it's a constant struggle in this process, trying to get the data in a timely fashion and make sure that it's clean. When you're talking about ticket scans, ticket, ticketing is one of the most, I think, stressful, difficult data environments. The in and out, the printing, the, it, it's, a, it's a product that's got an awful lot of nuances to it and the data is very complex. Um, this, um, we won't spend too much time on this, but this was probably like four months of our lives trying to, you know, you could not have devised a worse homestand to try to sell out than what Major League Baseball threw us this last April. Um, it's, you know, two of our favorite friends, Arizona, San Diego. Um, I always tell people when we think about the challenge, one third of our games every year are against Arizona, Colorado, and San Diego. One third of our home games, just think about it, 27 of our 81 dates are against those three teams. And again, not trying to offend any of the fans in here of any of those teams, but there's just no natural attraction, no rivalry, no spark to those three. There's no natural positive demand for us for those guys. We try with San Diego a little bit, but Arizona and Colorado, I don't know, I don't know where their fans are. They're just not here. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the, the upshot here is we survived this, um, but we survived it because we focused on this literally for three months. And now the challenge is now we're into the rest of the season and are we ready for what's coming up. Um, current initiatives, from my perspective and my group, obviously the sellout and, and the revenues there, still trying to establish a, a true foundation with a data warehouse for reporting and analytics. Um, trying to work on figuring out the best data information delivery methods to our senior executives and the rest of the folks that rely on this stuff for decision making. Um, this is a big one, is trying to get into a better, better predictive model so that commissions, sales focuses have more targets that they're shooting for. Um, I joke that the, the analytic method is often just where were we at this time last year? And every single season has its own nuances, its no, new changes. So where we were on May 6th last year is maybe relevant to where we are now and maybe not. We played that many more games, this, that, better opponents early, coming off a championship, not a championship, all sorts of things. But that's, that's all where typically that's always the first question that's being asked. How do we stand relative to last year? So I'm trying to change that to be more where are we relative to where we thought we were going to be? Where did we predict to be? How did we think this sales cycle was going to go? Um, so, and then trying to work on some predictive models to help with these streak management decisions. And um, inventory is a, is a huge challenge for us because we've got obligations for teams and umpires and employee comps, tickets that are not free for us to sell when we want to sell them. We've got to wait until sometimes an hour before the game before we know whether we can sell that ticket or not. And so it's very challenging, again, analytic model to say where are the fans going to come to buy that ticket if it's not really available to buy until an hour before first pitch. Um, so trying to work through that. Um, we're trying to tackle the sellout into more individual buckets and targeting different types of tickets for games. And again, back into the predictive modeling of, well, normally on a San Diego Tuesday night, this is what we would expect for group sales. This is what we would expect for a special event that we put on that event. So again, just trying to make it more manageable because we just say, okay, we did this many season tickets, we gotta sell this many tickets to finish the sellout streak. It's too big a puzzle, too many variables and it. Gotta take it in, trying to take it into more bite-sized chunks and manage it. But again, that's just more data points to manage. You break it down so that it's more manageable, but you need more resource and more systems to stay on top of all those different indicators. Um, have to put up the bobblehead slides just so it's there. Um, well, this is a good story, bad story. This is what today's presentation was supposed to be about originally, as Andy would tell you. You know, the whole plan when I committed to doing this was this is going to be great. I was going to work on the analytics related to this particular internal problem, which is that all those bobbleheads for those Irish nights and whatever, for the year, 
are managed against a fixed budget for the whole season. Doesn't matter how many we need for the sell-off streak, how many needs to be done, it's all managed against a fixed capped budget. And when something does really well or we might want to reorder it, now you've got to go through a budget variance process and a whole bunch of reasons to try to do it. And it just, I'm trying to work on the analytics of what it's costing us as a company to not have more items available to us so that it, you know, because again, the alternative is um, if I've run out of Hello Kitty bobbleheads, <laughs> that I was getting $5 or $10 over the regular ticket price when I was selling those. Now the alternative is I've got to go to a discounted area, go to other demand, and basically take less revenue to get, that same, get somebody into that seat. So to what extent can I predict and model out exactly what this policy is costing me, and then how do I try to work through the organization to make that change? Um, just to wrap up this piece, so many good questions. To streak or not to streak? You know, sellout streak is a good thing. It's got a, a lot of positives to it, but there's also some things that would be a lot simpler, a lot easier, and in some ways better for the organization. So even just making sure that question gets posed internally and then figuring out what might be the right analytics to tackle that question. Um, you know, what's the right level of investment in analytics and data when you're in a boom cycle? We've won three championships in the last five years. We've sold every ticket, basically every ticket that we've got to sell for five years. Where, where do you get the initiative internally to invest in analytics? How do you demonstrate it's gonna be better? It's, it's one thing if you've got a whole bunch of empty seats and you're saying, I need, this, I need this extra analyst, I need this extra system in order to sell those extra seats. Now I gotta say, I need that in order to sell it for even more money. And those of you that are paying those ticket prices, I apologize, but that's what they want me to do. Um, and then we're not a strong analytic organization and the industry, despite Moneyball, we're not really that either. It's really come, you know, it wasn't that long ago that baseball scouting was that guy with a cigar sitting there writing some handwritten notes and phoning him in. And it, it, when I started 25 years ago, that's definitely the way that it was. Um, the technology and the analytics is relatively late and it's still not really fully embraced. But it, it's, it's trying to catch up but in terms of normal industry, I'd say we're still behind. And so this becomes tough in terms of how do, I, how do I find the right methods to get more acceptance for analytic arguments inside the organization. Um, and then with limited resources, how do I decide what's the most impactful analytic project to tackle? Uh, I've rattled off 20 in the time that we've been talking in this presentation. But to go back and say, if I've, I, can, I only do three of them right now, which one should I do? There's no real system that says, well, this one's going to have this impact and this is going to have that. So again, um, hopefully you got a little sense of behind the scenes at the Giants, or at least in, in sports industry. Um, and I'm glad to have got a few minutes to answer any other questions that, that folks might have, okay. including whether Kane and Peavy are actually going to do anything <laughs> for us. Jerry, thanks very much. We got um, just a couple of yeah, a couple of minutes for questions. So let's go. Um, the gentleman there, the glasses. Yeah. So if you can bring the mic down right on the edge there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Nervous I was with Alan Hamilton. Um, I was curious. Uh, you t you talk primarily about ticket sales, but what about maximizing revenue per seat and concessions? And uh, are you are you looking into that in terms of? Uh, it's it, it's certainly a factor. I mean, we haven't quite, and now you get into the uh, the ethics conversation a little bit earlier and whatever else. At what point do we start modeling that if I sell this $20 ticket to this person, they're more likely to go into their wallet and spend 25 at concessions versus this person that might pay 25 for that ticket, but is not going to go into their wallet. They're going to bring their own packed sandwich and everything else in the ballpark. We're not, we're not quite there yet, um, but it is definitely a factor to try to look at, especially when you're having as much success selling the tickets. Now the auxiliary revenues and the ability to grow that becomes that much more important because that's where the growth of the revenue can come. Because at some point, people are going to say, I'm not going to pay that price for the ticket. Um, hopefully not yet, but. Is a question right at the front here? Yes, sir. Um, can we bring the, can we get a mic down here? Thanks. Thank you. My question had to do uh, with that, in fact, uh, knowing that you can't really say uh, this season looks like last season or the season before that, 
what sort of analytics would you have in place to know that you've maximized your revenue? If you're selling them out, how do you know that there's not more to sell? Well, I mean, we, we use a, you know, a QQ, a third party that helps make some recommendations on pricing because, again, those 1600 is hard to stay on top of. Um, and you're right, year to year you have challenges. Um, and, and similarly, part of it comes down to did we, get, did we program it right in the first place? Um, in our variable pricing tiers, we use single, double, triple home run as the four levels of games. And so that's been communicated to the customers for years now that as season ticket holder, you get your package, you understand it's a single game, a double game, triple game. One of my challenges right now is I think I need to add a fifth category and I'm not quite sure naming convention wise how I'm going to get away with that. <laughs> if anybody has any suggestions for that, please let me know because right now it's single, double, triple, home run and opening day is a grand slam. So and the challenge is I actually need to add a category at the bottom. So I don't want to call a game a strikeout. That's Round a bad out. idea. Yeah. Um, so we've got to think about something that goes be b below single. Maybe it's a walk. <laughs> Maybe, it's, Maybe it's a walk. But because um, again, we just, we, you get constrained in the model with just the, those categories. And what we found effectively is what our singles are in the months of April and September are actually just enough weak enough that we really need another category. Um, you know, in order, and again, ideally you'd have 81 different ones, but you have to, you're balancing off the analytic complexity with what the consumer base is willing to accept. Because you, if you say it's really 81 games, you know, the, the, the general public buying individual tickets, quickly the prices diverge into 81 different sets. But for the season ticket holder that you're asking to buy all 81 games, if you jumped 81 different prices on them, they're like, wait a minute, no, that's, that's not going to work. Let's take one final question on this side of the room. Let's have a look. I, I'm looking for anyone I know. You've asked a question this morning. You've asked a question this morning. Um, is there anyone else? OK, there you go. Thank you very much. So uh, I occasionally hear concern about the giant sort of appealing more to a white collar audience, less to a blue collar audience. And I'm wondering, you know, that's kind of a long term issue that I think you guys can or cannot deal with in your group, I don't know, but I'm wondering how much you, you are able to actually kind of work with that sort of thing and see if, if there's a way of, of reaching out to people who are not in the traditional audience. Well, uh, there's a couple, a couple ways there. One is that we definitely want to stay affordable across the spectrum. Um, as much as we talk about the high ticket prices, when the season started, they were at least 15 games that there was a $9 ticket. We, when we opened the ballpark, we wanted to be competitive with a movie. I think we're now under a movie in terms of the price to come out to the ballpark. Um, one of the things that we do, and that those special events that I talked about in the Irish night and the other thing, you're reaching out to that non-traditional fan. And we actually, um, we have some baseball ticketing meetings in Seattle next week, and one of the things we were asked to present on was the new customer acquisition component of those special events. And we did some quick analysis earlier this week, and we found that it now represents 10% of the new customers into the Giants world every year are the people that are coming to specifically their first purchase was Star Wars Day, or it was Irish Night, or it was Stitch and Pitch Night, whatever the case was. Of those, 30% of those people have now an independent second transaction with us after that first one. And some of those include group sales, luxury purchases, and season tickets. So the ability to do something that's kind of non-baseball to bring the folks in, because we think we have a great product, a great ballpark, you can get hooked on it pretty fast if we can get you there the first time. So part of our programming is to reach out and find ways to bring new people in, and that's partly community tickets. You know, you're going out to various community agencies, making them available. There's a uh, baseball commissioner's initiative that makes it easy for us to reach out to communities and use tickets. They also help patch the sellout streak at times, I won't lie. Um, but you're reaching out to various community agencies to try to bring in non-traditional fans. And then even simple stuff like, you know, we do 20,000 Little League tickets. And you're bringing in Little Leaguers, but also typically their parents, who again, without that connection, might not have come out and experienced the ballpark. And then it's up to us to make sure that they have a good experience and we take care of them once they're there so that they want to come back. Jerry, thanks much, and good sure. to see the ring. Yeah, got the ring. There you go.